Hi guys! So, today I'm going to talk about excitonic insulators. These are a class of electrical insulators whose formation depends on a sort of electrostatic attraction between electrons and their hole like counterparts, ultimately giving rise to the proliferation of a whole bunch of charged neutral quasi particles that end up quenching out any net electronic transport. To see how this can make sense, we'll need to come to at least a basic understanding about the physics of electrons in real materials. To this end, we can explicitly solve for the quantum mechanical equations of motion for electrons living inside a periodic set of atoms by appealing to the Schrodinger equation. Solving this, we'll end up providing us with a set of quantized energy levels for the electrons which, when plotted out as a function of their momentum, generates a neat periodic graph that's called the band structure of the material. Now this band structure can end up looking quite complicated, and its appearance will of course depend on the details of the material, but we can usually simplify its appearance by focusing on only one period of the graph and zooming into super low energies. Doing this results in a simplification of the material band structure to a simpler picture, which now involves just one high-energy conduction band and one low-energy valence band. Actually filling up this band structure with real electrons will then allow us to define an energy level, given by the energy of the highest energy electron. This is what's called the Fermi level, and in a previous VOD we saw how this allowed us to classify materials as either insulating or conducting based on the presence or absence of a gap in the band structure around this Fermi level. In a nutshell, this is because if there is a gap, then it becomes difficult for the electrons to reach the next available quantum energy state, making them in a sense immobile and giving rise to electrically insulating behavior. On the other hand, if there is no gap, then the opposite is true, and this is generally associated with electrically conducting behavior. For this reason, materials with a moderately sized band gap are often referred to as semiconductors, since they can either be insulating or conducting depending on the number of electrons present in the system. Pretty cool. So, what happens if we take a semiconductor which is in its insulating state and force it to conduct by pushing electrons up and over the gap, all while keeping the number of electrons fixed? This turns out to be a pretty easy thing to do since all you really need to do is to apply some heat to the material. So long as the thermal energy is larger than the energy of the gap, then this condition should be satisfied. In fact, this exact experiment has been done on a whole multitude of semiconductors, and the result always seems to be a net reduction in the measured resistance as temperature is increased, as expected since we're giving the electrons enough energy to jump the gap. But one detail that's often overlooked in these experiments is the potential effects that the absence of a valence electron can have on the dynamics of the system. To be specific, Forcing an electron up and into the conduction band not only activates a mobile conduction electron, but also leaves behind the absence of a valence electron in the valence band. This electronic hole, as it were, can move around as it gets sequentially filled by neighboring valence electrons, and it can therefore be thought of as its own quasi-particle with a charge opposite to that of the electron. This of course gives it a positive charge, and because of this, it can in principle exert an attractive electrostatic force to any electrons that lie outside the valence band. This should come as no surprise since, after all, if we excite an electron into a higher energy state, it will naturally want to relax back down to its ground state, and this is most easily done by simply recombining the electron in the hole. However, this isn't the only possibility. Much like the Earth and the Moon form a rotational bound state mediated by the attractive force of gravity, an electron and a hole can also form a bound state, called an exciton. If the energy lost in the formation of this exciton is larger in magnitude than the energy of the gap, then this turns out to be an energetically favorable process, and can be a real possibility in certain materials. But why should we care? What effects might these excitons have on the electronic properties of the material? Well, for starters, 
it's pretty easy to see that the net charge of an exciton is identically equal to zero, since it consists of an electron and its oppositely charged hole. This means that excitons produce no electrical current, and in fact, since their existence depends on the consumption of an otherwise mobile conduction electron, they actually tend to hurt the conductivity rather than help it. To make matters worse, excitons consist of two fermions, making them a boson, in turn implying that there is no limit to the number of low energy excitons that we could have in our system. This results in a spontaneous condensation of a whole bunch of excitons into the same low energy state, immediately stripping away all of our conduction electrons and giving rise to what's now called an excitonic insulator. Cool beans. Now, since this excitonic insulator depends on subtle quantum mechanical processes that are easy to overlook, it'd be pretty cool to be able to observe one in reality. But is there any evidence that these actually exist? Well, to answer this, we'll first need to know exactly what to look for. And this means having a well-defined theory with which to make predictions. Fortunately, the physical mechanism underlying the condensation of excitons has been seen before, specifically in the context of S-wave superconductors. Here, the underlying bosons are what are called Cooper pairs, and their condensation is effectively what allows for zero-resistance transport in certain materials. But even though these Cooper pairs aren't the exact same thing as the excitons that we've seen, the underlying mathematical framework governing their condensation could be. And this is encapsulated in what's called BCS theory, aptly named after its founders. In a nutshell, the general idea behind this theory is that you can diagonalize the Hamiltonian operator in the presence of a slightly attractive interaction by performing a change of basis on the wave functions and obtaining a quasi-particle energy spectrum that way. This allows one to obtain various observables in the context of linear response theory and ultimately provides us with a well-defined prediction for what the effective band structure should look like in the presence of excitons. This can then be checked experimentally using fancy experimental techniques like ARPES, which basically just uses conservation of momentum to probe the allowable energy states inside a material. In fact, this exact thing has been done on the excitonic insulator candidate titanium diselenide, and the agreement between excitonic insulator theory and reality is pretty convincing. Besides BCS theory, Another thing that we can look for is what we expect the charge density distribution to look like in the presence of excitons. To see what I mean by this, let's assume that our band structure consists of one valence band at zero momentum and one conduction band at finite momentum. In this case, there will be a relative momentum shift between the electron and the hole that make up the exciton, giving it a finite momentum. In the context of quantum mechanics, having a finite momentum is really just the same thing as having a finite wavelength for the quantum mechanical wave function that makes up the exciton. This results in a periodic charge density wave which, since there are so many excitons condensed into the same low energy state, can end up pulling on the underlying atomic nuclei in order to match the periodicity. The resulting periodic lattice distortion can then be measured using atomic imaging techniques. In the particular case of titanium diselenide, its band structure does allow for finite momentum excitons, and so you could expect a periodic lattice distortion in this material to match the geometry of the band structure. And what do you know? This is exactly what was observed on titanium diselenide probed using scanning tunneling microscopy. So that's already pretty decent evidence that titanium diselenide could be an excitonic insulator. One final thing that I want to mention is about a relatively new material which has only recently been thought of in the context of excitonic insulators. It's called tungsten ditelluride, and it's actually a monolayer topological insulator, which is a class of insulators whose electronic structure can be categorized by some topological invariant. We've actually talked about topological insulators in detail in a previous VOD, but for now, we can just think of them as fancy-looking semiconductors, and according to experiments done on this one, it could be an excitonic insulator too. In these experiments, 
Researchers put monolayer tungsten ditelluride into its insulating state by tuning the Fermi level into the band gap. Then, at super low temperatures, they applied a perpendicular magnetic field and monitored the resistance. Now, in a true insulator, the resistance should have no dependence on magnetic field, since the magnetic force scales with the velocity of the charge carriers and in an insulator this is zero. However, somewhat surprisingly, researchers actually saw oscillations in the magnetoresistance which look a lot like those seen in the integer quantum Hall effect. To explain this, researchers posited that, while it is an insulator, it's specifically an excitonic insulator, giving a finite velocity to the charges in spite of the fact that the measured current is zero. While the full details for what exactly happened to the magnetoresistance in this context haven't been completely worked out yet, it is possible that there is some internal magnetic field coming from the spins of the charges, which can couple to the external magnetic field and give rise to the observed oscillations. While this hand-wavy argument isn't as convincing as those for titanium diselenide, it's still pretty cool to acknowledge it as a possibility, since if it were true, this would mean that monolayer tungsten ditelluride is a topological excitonic insulator, which is a pretty cool thing to say. And that's going to do it guys, this is of course a pretty new and rapidly evolving field, so if you found it as cool as I did, go check out the literature, I've included a bunch of references in the description. Besides that, if you like the content, like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you guys next time. Ciao!